22, uh, I began my career in foster care. And early in my career, it was late one Friday night, and uh, actually Lori and I were already in bed for the night, and the phone rang. Well, I happened to be on call this weekend, and for anybody that has had to be on call, you know the hated sound of the phone ringing when you're on call. Uh, and on the other end of the line was Portage County Department of Job and Family Services, which is Ravenna up in northeast area of Ohio, northeast Ohio area. And they were asking if they had a if we had a foster home for two young boys, eight and ten, whose parents were unable to care for them. And I really don't clearly recall why, but I surmise it was neglect uh, because the parents struggled with alcoholism. So we were able to find a home, a foster mom, a single parent. Uh, foster mom in New Philadelphia that night in about midnight when we took off. And anybody's familiar with Ohio geography, uh, Ravenna to New Philadelphia, Dover area is about an hour. And uh, transporting a child, or in this case two boys, um, to a foster care or residential placement uh, on our main campus in Worcester is always a sensitive situation. First, you're meeting the children in one of their most trying times. They are scared, leaving what is known. They are anxious. Oftentimes, they're asking, what have I done that this has happened? Where am I going? What will the foster home be like? Will the foster parent be nice? So this night, I tried to connect with the boys, tried to show as much care and compassion as I could, um, but they actually were in the back seat. You know, it's dark as you're out on the highways heading down, and at about 30 minutes into our drive, uh, it got really quiet in the car. And I really thought and prayed that the boys had to be exhausted as it was now past midnight, hoping that they were going to nod off. But a couple minutes later, I heard a small voice from the back seat inquire, Sir, are you going to be our new daddy? I have to admit, this question caught me off guard. It took me a second to connect my thoughts, and I had so many in that moment. My heart breaking for these two young boys. To be that young and not understand the situation wondering if this person, me, who had just met them just over 60 minutes ago, would be their new dad. After a short time, I did respond, but I have to admit I was choking up as I told them, no, I was not going to be their new daddy, but I was taking them to a home where a lady desired to help kids who needed a place to stay, who would take care of them and would love them. Even though that night happened a long time ago, kind of challenging for me to even say 35 years ago. It cemented me, cemented for me the importance of providing safe, loving spaces where children can be free to understand how much they are worth with Jesus Christ. Scripture points out Jesus even rebuking even the disciples as they attempted to keep children away from Jesus. They were that important to him. Children who are so much more than what has happened to them. Children who have experienced the brutal pain of trauma, whether that be abuse and neglect, and to be able to watch them heal, grow, and flourish when they realize who they are according to the one who created them, the God of the universe. So I begin this morning with this story for a couple reasons. One, helping people experience and when I say people, I mean children and adults, experience their worth in Christ is our purpose at Christian Children's Home Ohio and our family ministry. Helping people experience their worth in Christ. Including those family ministries are our CCHO residential program, which is our 165-acre campus just north, north of Worcester, Ohio, our encouraged foster care, Encompass Christian counseling, and our One Heart Stables equine therapy program. I also started with this story because I want you to understand how much your support of CCHO's ministry impacts the children we serve. It is not 
hyperbole to say without the prayer and financial support of churches like Avena Road, we would not be able to help more than 1,500 in children and adults each week understand their worth in Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I am so grateful for your amazing grace. I am so grateful for your love, your faithfulness. I am so grateful to be able to serve at a place like Christian Children's Ohio and to be able to share at wonderful churches like Athena Road the story that you are weaving, the tapestry that you are weaving at CCHO, and the important partnership and contribution that Athena Road makes. I pray, Father, that you would be glorified in everything that is said and done. I pray, Father, may we um, be amazed once more of the amazing gift that you have given us in the salvation through Jesus Christ. Bless this time, Lord. Bless this church. Bless these people. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I said I'm grateful that Jason's already uh, introduced, but I am one really, really happy to have my wife Lori with me here, me here today. And we're blessed with two wonderful children and their spouses, and we also have two granddaughters, three and one, Aria and Amelia. Um, they are the light of our lives, and if you see us after, we have pictures and everything at the table. No, uh, we are blessed. And it really is true, though, when they say, if you like being a parent, wait till you're a grandparent, because it's even more amazing, and it is. And actually, I do have my own philosophy on why it's even more amazing. Because when you're a parent, you are so determined to do everything right. Right? Like, if they breathe wrong, you know it. Like, did that come out of the right or left nostril? If they come out of both nostrils, what's going on? Do we need to call the doctor? What's up, Sam? You know what? And as a grandparent, you know, no matter what you do, you're not going to screw it up. Because they're so resilient, right? You're like, you can just play and have fun and not have worries. Hey, they got cut. Big deal. Put a big, you know, put some dirt on it and stuff like that. It's really bad. But that's my comment, so it's cool. Um, so, but at, at CCHO, as we help people experience their work in Christ, we must guide them in understanding their identity to comprehend their work. Who am I? Who are you? You know, that is, um, I think, a question many of us uh, spend our whole lives trying to understand. And what is our identity? And I uh, shared with a couple people in Sunday school, I love golf. Um, I'm addicted to golf, I apologize. It was actually my first job I ever had um, was actually at a golf course and it came with free golf, so I talked about it being the most expensive job I ever had because I got hooked on golf. But I still, to the day, when I play golf, I mark my golf ball with a cross. And um, one of the things why I do that is because I need to remind myself every time I play that my identity is not in my golf sport. Isn't that crazy? I'm 57, and you know, I'm still trying to figure out my identity is not on whether or not I make a par or not a golf play. You can judge me all you want, but that's who I am. So, uh, But this morning, I'm going to look briefly at how the Apostle Paul describes our identity in Jesus in Ephesians 1. And I must make a disclaimer here, because I know I've listened to a couple of Jason's uh, sermons, and he's done a fantastic job when he unpacks scripture. I don't have the time that Jason has to take a couple weeks to unpack Ephesians 1 because we could literally take a month to unpack Ephesians 1. So I'm just going to be scratching the surface of the rich theology that's found in there. Um, but today I want to focus on what and how the Apostle Paul described our identity in Christ. Just a quick reminder, uh, the author of this passage is Paul, who was known as Saul before Jesus gave him a new identity. Huh? was according to the book of Acts, um, at Stephen Stone, at Stephen's Stone, that's tough to say fast. The first verse of chapter 8 of Acts says, Saul approved of the killing of him, Stephen. The third verse of chapter 8 talks about Paul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and placed them in prison. Other versions say that Paul created havoc or ravaged the church. Somebody we would love to have around, right? Then chapter 9 begins with, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciple. And then Jesus got a hold of Saul on the road to Damascus, and his life was changed forever. Not only was Saul, Paul's life changed forever, this enemy of Jesus goes on to write nearly two-thirds of the New Testament. I mean, you couldn't script that, how amazing that is, an amazing grace. Well, now let's look at 
Paul, as he writes the book of Ephesus, probably around AD 60, 62, and most likely in prison. In prison, writing this epistle. So, starting at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, I'm going to read through verse 14. By the, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to be put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance into the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Oh, my goodness, those verses. Man, get the hair on my eyes stand up when I read those. So, um, let's look at how Paul, again, writing those words in prison, uh, describes us in this doxology, which um, in the original Greek was actually written in one sentence and would likely have been sung in the early church. Now, how crazy would that have been to hear that? I mean, I couldn't even say it without God's They actually sang that in the early church. But first, Paul mentions that we are blessed. But not only blessed with every, but blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. So as Christians, as ones who believe in Jesus, we have every blessing that comes with eternity with Christ. And it's interesting to me that Paul doesn't mention this in the future, but presently, that we're blessed with every spiritual blessing now. And that can take some time to dissect right there. We are chosen. The creator of the universe chose us. I don't know about you, but I know the stigma of being picked last. And with the, for the children we work with, and even a lot of the adults we work with, this is a familiar feeling of being unwanted, worthless, and abandoned. But Paul here says that we are chosen. I wonder if we can pause for a moment and let that sink in. We, you, I are chosen. It's not because of our looks, our talents, our wealth, our jobs, our golf scores. It's because of Christ. We're wanted, we're desired, we're chosen. But stop, Paul doesn't even stop there. We're not only chosen, but we are holy and blameless in God's sight. Remember, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we are a new creature, a new creation in God's sight, holy and blameless. It's hard for me to even understand that, because I know who I am. What a Savior we have. And then, adopted to sonship through Jesus Christ. We are blessed to have our Encouraged Foster Care Program. We have, adopted, we have had nearly 300 adoptions for foster parents adopting their foster kids. And I know, I, actually, Jason and, and has been through this process. Uh, that there's probably many people in here maybe have been adopted or are adopting or have or had adopted in the past. Um, but one of the more powerful scenarios in our field most powerful scenarios in our field is the court hearing for the finalization of adoption. Because it, adoption is a process. Like when you just open your heart and say, man, I want to be an adopted parent, it's a process. Don't let anybody tell you it's not. Um, first, 
there's a training and a home study, a process that is long and exhaustive, and they ask personal questions. But part of it is, they're bringing a child into your home, the most precious resource we have. It's the next generation they're bringing into your home. Then a family needs to be matched to a child. And here's where it even gets even, even more difficult at times, because sometimes there's a child that has multiple families that are interested in the same child, and it becomes a picking process. So imagine saying you want to open your home to a child, and then you don't get picked. Imagine dealing with that rejection. It's a process. But there are times that you do get picked. And it becomes you get that child placed in your home. And the pre-finalization services provided by agencies like ours encourage foster parent our foster care program, and then the big day, the court hearing where the judge is going to grant permanent custody to the to adoptive family. But the process is so cool. So you see the, the foster child and foster family and their attorney a lot of times uh, enter the big, in some cases, this prestigious courtroom. And out of the side chambers, the judge and their flowing gowns come striding in the room, and everyone rises. Everyone rises, the judge sits down on the bench. Sometimes he looks like a throne. And most times, the judge lovingly interacts with the child and asks several questions about they know what is going to happen during their special day. And oftentimes during this, though, the child is nervous and shy and a little scared. Because for many of them, the last time they were in the courtroom where I seen the judge, they were testifying to the trial that had occurred to them or the neglect or the abuse. So imagine the dichotomy in that, of being in that courtroom. Yet for this time, uh, is they're here for a totally different reason. They grant permanent custody to the foster parents, become a permanent part, part of the family. Adoption, what a blessing. And imagine the judge being God and Jesus saying, he is mine or she is mine. And the judge says, welcome to my family. Adopted into the family of God. Adopted into sonship with Jesus Christ. I'll never forget the picture of one of our young, encouraged foster care girls being adopted a couple year, years ago. And what is customary, the judge will actually ask the adopted child if they're of age, if there is anything they would like to say to the court. And the judge asks if this young girl had anything else to say. And she shyly asks the judge if she could sing, Jesus loves me in the courtroom. And I'm telling you, there wasn't a dry eye in the courthouse as that young girl began singing. And by the end, the whole courtroom, including the judge, joined along and sang Jesus' love. you talking about, a, that to me is like a glimpse of eternity, how cool that is. Adoption, what a beautiful picture of salvation. But Paul isn't done. Through Jesus, we are also redeemed and forgiven. Can we take just another moment let that wash over us? We need a redeemer. We have all sinned and fallen short. We have all acted in ways that hurt God, and yet, in his love, he sent his son to redeem us, to buy us back. We are redeemed. And forgiven, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us. I told you, you've been unpack these verses for a long, long time. Forgiven, washed away. When we beat ourselves up over our past sins, when we become paralyzed because of our past, Jesus stamps forgiven and that you are a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. And I would like to highlight one final identifier Paul uses in this script, section of Scripture, marked and sealed. Sealed by the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing our inheritance. Not only does God allow us or redeem us and forgive us, but he sends his spirit to allow us to live out his will here on earth. I was actually um, reading a, a short, actually it was Dallas Willard's presentation to the American Association of Christian Counselors back in 2007. And his whole premise is with the Holy Spirit um, being inside us, we should not be choosing to love, we should literally be loved. So when Jesus says, um, love your enemies, we should be, like we should be the person that loves their enemies. I mean, we, that should be who, how, that's how we should react. Like we literally should be, I mean, you're talking about a challenging concept. 
But there's truth in it. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. I've been through, uh, I had the pleasure of leading men's Bible study at 6 o'clock on Sunday mornings for 13 years, and we probably did 50 Bible study books. And you know what all of them almost all ended up with? Deny yourself, give yourself more of the Holy Spirit, and let the Holy Spirit live through you. Like, 13 years, we shared the same thing, and yet it still came down to, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. We should make a difference for Christ. We have God living inside. Okay, I'll stop. Um, not, so the, I wonder, I wonder if the closest, those closest around us would testify that we live like we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Are the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control evident in my life, in your life? <clears throat> would the world say the fruits of the Spirit are evident in Christians? So let's review what we've discussed so far. For those of us who have believed and accepted Jesus Christ, we are identified by Paul, by Paul as blessed, blessed with every spiritual blessing, chosen, holy, blameless, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, sealed, and marked. That's all in 14 scriptures, verses of scripture. While Paul was in prison, right? What a picture of salvation. The ravager of Christianity wrote those verses. Our identity in Christ is not what others have called us, thought of us. It's not even the lies we tell ourselves. We have the identity Paul writes about found in these verses here. And that's why there is no greater purpose than the one we have at Christian Children's Home Ohio to help people experience their work in Christ. To realize that every person you or I will ever lock eyes with, today or forever, has that same work. No matter their gender, their ethnicity, their race, their religion, their political party, no matter anything, each of us have an inherent worth placed in them because Jesus came, lived, hung on a cross, and rose again to give them eternal life. And our responsibility is to tell as many people we can of this unbelievably good news, the gospel of Jesus. Paul, in a very familiar second chapter of Ephesians, goes on to describe the unbelievable good news that we are dead in our sins, but God. But God made us alive in Christ through grace. And verse 10 is one of my favorite verses in Scripture. It's actually, I, get, I write uh, happy birthday cards to all of our staff, and I, and I always end with Ephesians 2.10. It describes how we're to live after we accept Jesus in our baptism. For we are God's hand, we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are to do the good works that God has prepared for us in advance to do that may include bringing love to those whose society has thrown away. Whether that be through coming to work at CCHO, we have plenty of opening, uh, being a foster parent, or supporting the work through donations, or the most important thing, by praying for us. We covet your prayers. But the other aspect of Ephesians 2.10 that so excites me is that the Greek word translated handiwork in verse 10 also can be translated masterpiece. So we are God's masterpiece. Imagine how different we would think of ourselves if we thought ourselves that way. How our choices may be different. How our words may be more seasoned with grace when we recognize that we are God's sight. I close it. You know, that's always a dangerous thing when somebody speaks as I close. Because it usually means like three or four closing sounds. But I close this morning with an Old Testament verse which beautifully describes our identity and, and it's so powerful to me. Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He'll take great delight in you. In his love, he'll no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. The same God who is blessed with every spiritual blessing takes great delight in you. He rejoices over you through singing. With you singing. And when you look at the Hebrew reading of singing in that, in that way that verse is, it's not a quiet melody. It's a strong, powerful singing. The mighty warrior who saves lo is loudly singing over you. One final story about how God moved to CCHO. Heaven was a teenager, and her real name was Heaven. Her heaven was a teenager from Western Ohio with a severe traumatic history, sexually abused by her father, uncle, and brother. Heaven was angry, hurting, and confused. 
Heaven used loudness and doing shocking things to control her environment around her, including doing a strip tease on the roof of one of our cottages. And these are six to eight thousand foot or square foot cottages. These are not small buildings. But as I looked across the uh, uh, our field, I said, "What is she doing?" And she was, as well as in the parking lot of our administration building in front of a lobby full of Encompass Christian Counselor parents. These behaviors led many of our staff wanting to have heaven leave the program. It's always kind of difficult to say to have left heaven leave the program. But causing many discussions and disagreements on the viability of replacement at the at CCHO. But during this same time, River Tree Christian Church was sending one of their GO communities one Saturday a month to interact with our residential kids and make connections. And one family connected with heaven, and heaven started to understand her work in Christ. And she was loved by God, and was so much more than what had happened to her growing up. Tim and Shelly prayed about it, and decided God wanted them to adopt heaven. So they took the classes, did all that stuff I mentioned, all that process, did the home study, were licensed, and soon after, heaven came to live with them. In the next couple of years, heaven was baptized in an outdoor service at River Tree, graduated from high school, and got a job. Wanting her independence, but not wanting to move too far from her adopted parents, she set up a camper in the backyard of Tim and Shelley's, and just, uh, not this past summer, but the summer before, Heaven got married, and Tim walked her down the aisle. What a beautiful picture was God doing through the ministry of Christian Children of Ohio, and we can only do that through the support of churches like this one, like the Inner Road Church. And for that, we are eternally grateful. And I really am going to end this time. Uh, with a short video, which will also give you a picture of what God is doing at CCHO. Can you play Katie's story? So I really didn't know my mom. My real dad drank a lot of, a lot of alcohol. I had to jump from house to house, they were going like twice. And then I felt really super angry, really super alone. And but then I ended up here at the stage of I just wanted everyone to know that he is my Lord Jesus now. Learn that Jesus will always help me and figure out my problems when I need them. My life has been way more better than it used to be. Not only really getting less as angry as anymore as they used to. Thank you for just helping me see the show and all of us kids here. You really help us a lot by giving us comfort and love. My wife was just forever.
Our hymn of decision this morning will be the way of the cross. <laughs> 